If you're like me, last week you were eagerly awaiting the opening of the SNES Classic pre-orders, only to find out that most of the retailers put them up in the middle of the night, or they sold out in seconds, or were packaged in just ridiculously expensive bundles. Well, I guess we'll check out these bundles and... Wait a second. $330? For what? Oh, for an oil print? Really? What? Frustrated, I decided to take matters into my own hands. And that leads us to this. This is not an SNES Classic. It's a custom-built computer that fits in the palm of your hand. But it can play all the games the SNES Classic can, and a lot more. In this video, we're going to build our own homebrew SNES Classic for about $100, give or take a little bit depending on what hardware you already have. Let's stick it to the man, and let's get building. Who even needs retro gaming now that we have Sonic Mania? So this project isn't too hard, but it does require some level of competence with computers. We'll be working with a Raspberry Pi system running the RetroPi operating system. This comes with a bunch of emulators and a game organizer called Emulation Station. It also supports a bunch of old classic ports of games like Doom, Descent, Wolfenstein, and even Minecraft. Here's what you need to get started. The most important component is a Raspberry Pi, preferably a Model 3 for the best performance. This will run you about $35. You can get a kit like the one we got, which also includes the power supply and cable that you'll need, but you can also bring your own if you know how to make that work and save yourself a few bucks. You'll probably want a case for this. I'm using the Super Tiny Tendo SNES case, which costs about $25 when it's available. There are simpler and cheaper cases available, and you can also 3D print your own. To store the games in the operating system, you'll need an SD card, or a micro SD card for the Raspberry Pi models 2 and 3. 16 gigabytes should be more than plenty, but more space can't hurt if you want a lot of games. These can be had for about $15 or so. You'll also need a way to write to those SD cards from your computer. Many laptops and PCs already include SD card slots, so you may already be good there, but double check, and if you don't have one, you can get a USB reader for about $10. Finally, you'll need a controller. Uh, fortunately, RetroPie already supports a bunch of controllers, including the PS3 and PS4 controllers, the Wiimote, and even Xbox controllers if they're wired. But if you don't have one of those, I highly recommend picking up a controller from 8BitDo. This is their NES30 controller, which can be had for about $40. This has all of the features of a controller that you need for modern games as well as retro games, plus has this awesome retro-inspired look and feel to it. Once you get all the parts, it's pretty easy to install. Unscrew the four screws at the bottom of the case to open it. In this case, there are four screws and standoffs already installed. Undo these four screws, drop in your Raspberry Pi aligned to the standoffs, and screw them back in. Many Raspberry Pi kits come with little heat sinks. To apply these, just peel the sticker off the bottom and apply them onto the appropriately sized chips. They don't have to be aligned perfectly, but they should have the heatsink fins aligned in the same direction, pointing from front to back, so air can flow through it. If your case came with a fan, like the Super Tiny Tendo case did, follow its instructions included to plug them into the right pins on the Raspberry Pi. A fan is probably not strictly necessary, and can get super loud because the Raspberry Pi doesn't have any sort of onboard fan control like a normal PC does. Without a fan, the machine may slow down if it starts to overheat, but that would require some serious load or a really hot environment. After this is done, you can screw the case back together. That's the entire hardware setup process. To get the OS running, download the image for RetroPie from their website, making sure to get the right version for your Raspberry Pi. Also download the program Etcher, which will let us burn RetroPie onto the SD card. Both are available for free, and Etcher can be run on Windows, Linux, or Mac. With your SD card connected to the computer, Open Etcher, select the RetroPie image, make sure your SD card is in the selected drive, and hit flash. After a few minutes, your SD card will have RetroPie installed on it. Now you can begin copying games to it. Once that's all done, you can pop your SD card into the Raspberry Pi. Our case has a little slot for it on the bottom. Then plug in the HDMI cable to your TV, and plug in the USB power cable, and it should turn on. Raspberry Pis don't have on-off switches, so they're always on if they have power. You'll probably want a USB keyboard handy to configure things like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth for any controllers. After that, you can dive into the RetroPie wiki to learn how to configure everything. All the links can be found down in the description below. One thing you'll definitely want to do though is run the scraper. With your internet connection and a controller setup, 
Press the Start button to bring up the main menu, and you'll see the scraper settings. Run this across all of your games, and it will find cover art, descriptions, and metadata for everything in your library. So how well does a system like this work? Well, in general, it works pretty well, with the exception of one thing, and that is latency, or the time it takes for you to press a button on your controller and see that action reflected on screen. When I was playing super fast-paced, twitchy action games or arcade games, I would definitely notice that there would be a lot of time spent between pressing the button for, say, a jump action and seeing the character actually jump on screen. Enough so that in some games it actually threw me off to the point where I couldn't really play it very well because of how long it took to actually see those actions. There was a disconnect. Switching to a wired controller definitely helped, but it didn't fix the problem. Uh, and there was still a lot more latency than you would see if, than if you were running on actual hardware. It's not clear if the Super Nintendo Classic from Nintendo would actually have this problem the same way, but it certainly happens here. And the reason for that is simple, is that the Raspberry Pi just doesn't have a lot of processing power. It's running off of what is effectively a cell phone processor from a couple years ago, it just doesn't have a lot of power to it. It's built to handle low power environments rather than being a super high performance CPU. So if you're planning on playing really fast paced action games or twitchy platformers, maybe this isn't the best plan. But if you're like me and you just want to relive some of the old RPGs and strategy games from your childhood, then this is a really solid device and I highly recommend doing it. So what do you think? Are you planning on building a system like this? Or are you going to hold out for the official release of the SNES Classic on September 29th and hope to try and get one in the limited supply that's available? Drop a comment down below and tell me what you think. And make sure you subscribe for more DIY videos like this because I'd sure love to build more stuff like this in the future. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.